So welcome everyone to today's uh, colloquium. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce you to Janeo Estemir. Um, Janeo is an assistant professor at the Sangulak Bülent Institute University. And I'm very sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> And you just told me that he also recently became the um, vice dean at the faculty. So he is at the Department of Labor, Economics and Industrial Relations. And Janeb already visited, visited us here at the Wittgenstein Center. I think it was back in 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we worked already on, on skills adjusted human capital and published the article together where we suggested a new indicator for skills adjusted human capital. Now we are very happy that he's back. Kind of extending our work and now he's focusing on projections of skills adjusted human capital and also to study the potential impact of COVID-19 on adult skills and that will also be the topic of today's presentation so to near the floor is yours welcome again and yeah we're looking forward to your presentation thank you very much Claudia uh hi everyone uh as Claudia told this is a uh, ongoing project we conduct with uh, Claudio Reiter, the Kinders, and Anne Jean. Uh, and as uh, Claudio said, it's based on an earlier article of Thomas, uh, which was published on, in PNS last year. And in this article, we estimated uh, skills adjusted human capital uh, for 185 countries and five year uh, age group uh, by five year periods. Uh, between 1970 and 2015. And uh, in this paper, we showed that uh, global skills gaps uh, are increasing. Uh, you can see on the uh, right hand side uh, figure, which was taken from our article, uh, between the countries in the top and bottom quartiles around the world. So since 1970s, uh, the gaps uh, between countries, top and bottom quartile countries, in many years of schooling uh, have been decreasing since 1990. So it has increased until 1990 and has started to de decrease thanks to global expansion of education. But we look at SLAMIS, which is our uh, indicator of human capital, uh, so it takes account both uh, means of schooling and uh, quality of education. Uh, so skills uh, differences or differences in terms of quality of education uh, has been increasing continuously. So uh, it means that expanding education or uh, decreasing the gaps between top and bottom countries in terms of schooling uh, does not necessarily mean uh, decreasing skills gaps between countries. So uh, as a next step, uh, we wanted to uh, build on this work and uh, project skills adjusted in capital indicator SLAMIS to the future. But as we were working on uh, this project, uh, we had the pandemic and all around the world uh, countries uh, took measures to uh, deal with the spread of the virus and shut down schools. And as week, weeks passed and schools remained closed, uh, we realized that uh, this will have an impact of impact on uh, learning and thus future uh, adult skills uh, or future human capital of countries. So. Uh, we also wanted to incorporate this effect, this effect of learning losses during uh, school closures uh, in 2020 and 2021. So uh, in this project, we have basically two aims. First, to project slums, uh, or, uh, the indicator we uh, presented in our article. Uh, until 2050, and also to project the effects of learning loss due to the COVID-19 uh, school closures on adults' kids. Okay. So uh, let me talk a little more on uh, our indicator of human capital. So uh, this is a new uh, capital indicator, and uh, 
And of now, it's available uh, in five year age groups and five year periods from 1970 to 2015 for 185 countries around the world. Okay. And we, in this indicator, we take into account both the quantity of schooling and uh, quality of education and skills. We measure quantity of schooling with years of schooling and quality of education uh, with a skills adjustment factor. I'll explain in detail in a minute, but uh, you might ask why we need a new indicator indicate of human capital or education. Well, we have years of schooling, uh, enrollment rates, or uh, student assessment scores like PISA, PILS, TIMS, etc. So, uh, in, in the sense, Singapore is a good example. Uh, for example, uh, if you are interested in, uh, in uh, education, you might know about Singapore. They achieved a lot in terms of uh, schooling expansion in the last decades. And they are very successful in student assessment exams like PISA. The, uh, students from Singapore uh, most of the times uh, score top, uh, have the top scores in PISA or TIMS. Uh, so uh, many uh, studies uh, use these PISA scores or schooling grades as indicators of human capital and say that uh, Singapore has one of the highest human capitals around the world. But we, uh, if you look at this uh, population pyramid, uh, in the younger cohorts, for example, let's have a look at 25, 29 year olds of uh, 2015. So you see that most of, uh, almost all of uh, the 25 to 29 year olds in Singapore have at least upper secondary education or uh, more than 80% of uh, men and women have post-secondary education or more. So this is one of the highest uh, in the world. But if you go towards uh, the older age groups, uh, we see that uh, enrollment or attainment rates are lower, and there are also, for example, gender and sex differences. So if you look at uh, 60 to 64 year old women in Singapore. So more than uh, one third has uh, have primary education or less. So, and when we talk about human capital, we talk about the working age population. So, uh, would it be misleading to use, for example, PISA scores of 15 year olds to uh, as a proxy for total human capital in a country? So uh, that's why we want to incorporate both uh, the amount of schooling and uh, part of education for the working age population, not just uh, for the students. So using these two uh, dimensions, we calculated uh, an indicator we named as SLAMIS, and it's basically a product of years of schooling and skills uh, adjustment factor. And uh, skills adjustment factor uh, is calculated using uh, adapt skills uh, exams. Uh, so it's like PIAC of OECD or uh, STEM of World Bank. And uh, we include uh, SAF uh, to one for OECD average in every uh, education uh, and age group. So, for example, if in a country, uh, let's say 20 to 24 year old uh, high school graduates have higher adult skills than OECD uh, average. Uh, they have uh, slammies higher than their years of schooling and vice versa. Okay. So uh, you can see this difference in this parameter as well. Again, uh, the field bars for every education group is uh, the proportion of uh, adults uh, who have skills uh, above OECD average. And the striped bars are uh, the amount of uh, adults having skills below OECD average. Okay. In the case of Singapore, we see that in younger cohorts, there are more people uh, above OECD average, but we, as we go to 
uh, higher. Older cohorts, we see that uh, most of them are below OECD average for their peers in the same Asian education group. Okay. So uh, for the projections, how can we project these two dimensions? For the quantitative dimension, it's, it was easier for us because we already have uh, projections of years of schooling at Wittgenstein Center Data Explorer according to several scenarios. Uh, among them, uh, we used three main uh, SSV scenarios. And uh, one is uh, the medium scenario, which is assuming the current global trends continue. And there is a rapid development scenario and there's a stock development scenario. I'm not going into details too much, uh, since I guess most of uh, participants have uh, prior knowledge about it. Uh, but how can we project uh, quality of school? So our uh, skills adjustment factor. So we uh, use several steps to project uh, skills adjustment factor to the future. First one is about age patterns. As we have shown in our article uh, that I mentioned earlier, and also Claudia showed in another uh, article that uh, adult skills do not remain the same through one's lifetime. Right? We also know this from uh, other uh, research and uh, we wanted to incorporate it. Because as uh, Claudio showed in her article that uh, the uh, change in skills through lifetime also uh, differs uh, depending on the education level of the individual. So the ones who have higher levels of education, uh, this graph, for example, up, the ones have upper secondary or higher education, uh, actually increase their skills at younger ages. Sometime after they leave school, most probably because they still use their like, cognitive skills uh, as they uh, in, participate in the labor force. But the ones who have uh, lower secondary or less education uh, starts uh, losing their adult skills uh, just after leaving school and uh, at a rapid pace. So uh, we wanted to incorporate this age pattern uh, when we were projecting quality of uh, schooling or skills adjustment factor. And we applied these age patterns calculated by uh, Claudia uh, to the uh, current cohort. So we aged all cohorts according to uh, these age patterns. But uh, we need to project emerging cohorts as well. We can, we can uh, age existing cohorts uh, according to these age patterns, but we have to project the adult skills of uh, new cohorts. So, for this one, we used the trends in uh, code of education using OECD design exams. Since we are uh, using uh, literacy skills, uh, mainly, mostly based on OECD's peer uh, survey, we decided to use OECD, OECD's uh, student assessment, PISA, uh, reading score. So uh, PISA and PIAC uh, are measured uh, quite the same way. And uh, PISA is conducted among 15 year old students around the world. So it was uh, wise to use the scores of 15 year olds to project uh, 15 to 19 year old uh, adult skills. Okay. And uh, we calculated trends, five year average trends for every country. So, and used, in our, used them in our scenarios. Uh, we have uh, three scenarios, as I said. So uh, SSP1 is the rapid development scenario. In this scenario, we assume that uh, all countries will have the top trends. So currently, uh, Peru and Chile have uh, the highest increased trend in PISA. They increase their PISA scores uh, <clears throat> by 3% on average per five years. So we use this top performance uh, as for all countries in SSP1 scenario. 
for the uh, middle scenario arrangement scenario SSP2, we assume that until 2030, current PISA trends uh, will continue uh, as well for uh, SAF uh, until 2030. And then uh, we assume an average increase globally uh, around 1.5% for all countries. And for the uh, stock development scenario, uh, SSP3, we assume no increase in the education and so in skills adjustment factor. And finally, we also, as I said, uh, want to incorporate learning loss for cohorts affected uh, by school lockdowns during the COVID-19 pandemic. So for this one, uh, we used uh, a simulation done by uh, Azevedo and others, uh, starting from uh, the very beginning of the pandemic, my scholars wrote on the topic, so uh, everybody uh, was aware that there will be some learning loss after uh, that long school closures. But most of the studies are limited to few countries. Uh, Azamado and uh, colleagues uh, made simulations depending on the length of school closure and uh, country income levels for uh, 174 countries. So they simulated uh, the learning loss uh, by income level and uh, length of school closure uh, on LACE. LACE is uh, another indicator of uh, human capital calculated by uh, the World Bank people uh, last year. And it's called learning adjusted use of schooling. It's, it's very similar to SLAMIS, but they use student assessment scores instead of adult skills. So they just uh, use uh, student uh, assessments like PISA, PILS, TIMS, et cetera. So, uh, but we, in SLAM is we focus on adult skills. Uh, so we assume that the loss in place would be uh, equal to, uh, or would be proportional to the loss in uh, SAF. Yes. They are both measuring quality of education. So, as Awado and colleagues uh, introduced four different scenarios. In the optimistic scenario, they assumed there would be uh, three months of school closure. In the intermediate one, five months. Pessimistic uh, scenario is eight months of school closure. And the very pessimistic scenario is nine, nine months of school closure. So, we categorized countries, you know. Uh, some of the 45 countries according to uh, the length of uh, school closure and world bank income levels. Yes. Sorry, are these numbers, are they years of schooling or? This is lace. Lace. Of school closure. But there, are, there are two closures usually are much lower in the low income countries, like in Kenya, they make yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's lace, the learning adjusted years of school. This, this, ah, this is not the length of school closures, this is lace. Okay. Lace is very similar to years of schooling, pay, but they uh, adjust it according to uh, student assessment exams. Yeah, but what is the basis for this? There have not been any student assessment exams after the COVID. Yeah, yeah, they used uh, existing uh, evidence on uh, school closures uh, during natural disasters and summer breaks. So, using uh, existing information, they submitted uh, it with the length of school closures and uh, income level. So they also, sorry, they also uh, took into account uh, the like availability or uh, the availability of countries uh, to the, for example, online education like a broadband, broadband internet uh, infrastructure, uh, number of like PCs at home, etc. Um, just out of curiosity, do Acevedo et al. also account for when in the pupils schooling life course uh, the lockdown occurred but because i guess it makes a difference whether a child loses three months in grade uh, two or grade nine right They're yeah right. but uh yeah they calculated it through lace so lace is uh, calculated using uh, student assessment exams and they are conducted uh, for the children between the years uh, ages of six and 17 i guess so they assume that students uh, 
like student or schooling age population or compulsory schooling age population. But uh, in our projections, we applied these losses only to the cohorts who are at uh, their schooling age during the pandemic. Just to follow up on this, because I mean, it's possible that students lose a little uh, knowledge right after the lockdown, but then the schools um, manage to catch up again because they, they continue and they refresh. Yeah. And there's sort of a, a time trajectory after the, do you consider this as well? No, uh, but uh, a bit on purpose because we wanted to show uh, the projections if the lo learning losses during the pandemic are not compensated for. So, uh, so in a sense, we show uh, that the like, worst case scenario where these losses are not mitigated after the pandemic. So, uh, so we already know the income level of countries, but we also need uh, the length of school closures. Thanks to the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, they, uh, we uh, had access to this uh, data as well, because they, from the early days of the pandemic, they collected daily data on school closures. So in some countries, schools are closed fully, uh, in some countries partially, and uh, at different lengths. For example, this one is from April 20, 2020, at the peak of the pandemic, as you see, most of the like, world, more than half of the countries, uh, closed schools fully, and most of the rest was partially. But of course, some countries had longer school closures, so like, more than 40 weeks. Uh, like Mexico, Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, all of the Latin American countries, but in some countries, closures was as uh, less as six weeks. So, uh, according to using UIS data and World Bank income groups, we applied the change in lights to uh, uh, as the change in SAF in our uh, projections. So, let me show our results uh, in a few slides. This is uh, our projections for years of schooling and slummies for the year 2050. The gray bars are years of schooling and the dots are uh, slummies according to three different scenarios. As you might notice, uh, the variation between years of schooling uh, is still uh, much less than variation in uh, slammies. Okay. And uh, if you look at just the slammies projections, you can see that there is less variation, especially for the countries uh, from the global north, but uh, most of the global uh, south countries have more variation among uh, slammies projections in different scenarios. And in all these scenarios, COVID uh, learning losses are taken into account. But since it is, these are uh, for the whole working age population, uh, the effect of pandemic learning losses are not very visible. So that's where I'll show you the projections for one of the cohorts affected uh, by the pandemic. I mean, the cohort. Uh, that was in school during the pandemic, uh, the 45 to 49 year olds in 2050. So at the start, as uh, to use as a benchmark, we uh, projected SSP2 without taking into account the effect of learning losses during the pandemic. They are shown with these purple stars. But when we take into account the learning, the effect of learning losses uh, during the pandemic, it's uh, shown with this uh, blue uh, circles. Uh, so in some countries, uh, the uh, projection of slum is, is very close uh, without the effect of COVID. As you might guess, this is because they had uh, shorter school closures, but in some cases, it's, it's too much. For example, in Mexico. The projection of, uh, of slammies in SSP2 scenario with and without the effect of COVID is too much. 
And uh, we also projected SSP1 and SSP3 scenarios with uh, COVID learning losses. You can see that even in the best case scenario, SSP1 uh, projections cannot reach, uh, projections with COVID uh, cannot reach uh, to the medium scenario without the effect of COVID. And you can see again that in countries, or, uh, countries from the global south uh, mostly have uh, higher uh, losses during the pandemic uh, in terms of their adult skills. So we can focus a little bit more on individual countries. I selected 10 countries, and this is the uh, Islamist projections in the medium scenario without, without the uh, effect of uh, learning losses during the pandemic. So in general, we can see that in almost all countries, we expect slummies to increase. In some countries with a, a higher pace, like Peru or Turkey, in some with a, like, like, uh, a smaller like, pace, like in Australia, because they already have very high levels of slummies. But uh, for the cohorts that are affected from the pandemic, who were in school during the pandemic, uh, there are some losses. Okay? So these uh, blue dots are projections with the effect of COVID, uh, school closures. Okay? And in some countries, like in Armenia or Australia, there are not much differences because they had uh, very short uh, school closures compared to others. But in some cases, like Peru, Mexico, uh, Poland, or Turkey, the differences are high. But you can, you can see that, for example, in Turkey, Turkey has been increasing uh, slammings for the, like, uh, for the last decades. But when you take into account the effect of COVID learning losses, it drops to the levels of 15 years, uh, 15 year older cohorts. So the gains of 10, 15, 20 years in terms of adult skills are lost uh, or maybe lost during the pandemic if uh, these learning losses are not compensated for. Okay. So uh, I also wanted to share two neighboring country uh, comparisons. Uh, last results slide. Uh, on the left hand side, there's USA and Mexico. Uh, if uh, you look at the projections, you see that in almost all scenarios, Mexico is catching up with uh, its neighbor USA, but only except for uh, these two cohorts, these are the ones that were affected uh, from the pandemic. So who were in school during the pandemic. So for this cohort, the gaps are high. Oh, it, it's the case for the compares of Greece and Turkey as well. Turkey reaches uh, in younger cohorts. You might notice that, but I noticed that this is going from old rates to longer, uh, lower reaches because to, to show the development better. So as you go to the younger cohort, you see that so Turkish adults are reaching uh, their peers in uh, Greece, but almost in all scenarios, but the cohorts affected by the pandemic closures uh, are lagging behind in terms of adult skills. So, sum up. Uh, so we found out that skills gap between countries may widen or uh, shrink depending on their demographic uh, development. So we saw that in SSP1 scenario, uh, we expect uh, less uh, differences in terms of adult skills between countries. But in uh, SSP3 scenario, which was the worst case scenario, we expect bigger differences. And uh, school closures during the COVID-19 pandemic have effects on adult skills that are in some countries like uh, Peru, Mexico, or Turkey, 
equal to the skill gains of a few decades if uh, these losses are not compensated. Also, uh, the skills gap between developed and developed countries from uh, global north and global south may increase even more if no remedies will be implemented against learning losses during the pandemic. Uh, that was all uh, for my side, but I will be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you very much for listening.